welcome to So It's a Show, a podcast where we attempt to keep up with Lorelai and Rory's pop culture references on Gilmore Girls. I'm Taylor. I am Kyla. Uh, uh, um. <laughs> Malfunctioning. Ha, so ha, something ha. Gato, Mr. Roboto. Dodo. <laughs> <laughs> Engaging, realistic, human person. Hi, I'm Kyla. Hi, I'm Taylor. And was that my most embarrassing introduction yet to this show? I don't know, because you did play the piano badly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, probably not as badly as Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty. No, I guess I suppose you had a bad song to begin with. It was not your fault. This is true. And I was a little more aware than their characters were. But now, I am not being cool like many fembots. Well, but Taylor, don't you think that we are the ultimate fembots in that we come off as human normal beings when we want to? Like right now? Hmm, yes. Don't blow our cover, Kyla. I bet. Shoot. She's looking at me with crazy robot eyes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, here we are. And here we are, attempting to keep up with Lorelai and Rory's pop culture references. Yes, we are indeed. But first, so I just got back from quite the gathering. Oh, do tell. Uh, I was at Podcast Movement 2017. Ooh, ooh. And uh, Taylor was not with me, but I wish that she would have been. Move it, move it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we now have a couple matching t-shirts, so that's good. <laughs> Yay! Thank you for getting me the awesome podcast swag. No problem. Every lover and creator of podcasts needs some podcast swag. One thing I didn't get you, but I got myself... A podcast fidget spinner. Whoa, don't we all need one of those? (laughs) I think so. Um, It's pretty entertaining. It's not necessary, but it's entertaining. What makes it a podcast fidget spinner? It just has a brand on one side. But the other side says, hear my voice. And I really like that tagline. Oh, there you go. I hear you. I hear your voice. I hear you as well, Taylor. Oh, wait, wait. Break it. Okay. Okay. Now I hear you. It's all good. Oh, Mm -mm. (laughs) thanks. Yeah, but it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Hopefully can use some of that and give you guys some great ear biscuits. And (laughs) ear biscuits. (laughs) That's a new one. It is actually a podcast name. And I think they mean like, like ear candy. That's basically what I took from it, but I yeah. didn't realize it was a company. See, I think people like biscuit. Not a company, just a podcast. Oh. Individual. Oh, I like it better as the name of a podcast than a podcast company. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I wouldn't really take your biscuits that, that seriously. But, so, FYI, guys, if you're thinking of starting a network called Ear Biscuits, <laughs> don't do weird. it. Weird. We would not be a part of that. Eh, gross. gross. Unless it's honey biscuits. Mm. Mm. <laughs> or red lobster biscuits. But we're getting off track. <laughs> no biscuits here. Uh, yeah. But Podcast Movement was a lot of fun. Met Dan Taberski, our friend, who yes! uh, um, got to talk to him a little bit about it. I asked him if he listened to the episode, and he didn't. And I was like, that's fine. That's cool. There's other things to listen to, I guess. <laughs> but I let him know that we discuss his podcast and that Taylor was a little more critical of it than I was. <laughs> so, um, rad on you totally, but appreciated that we talked about it and it was so funny. I saw him walking cause it was the before party before the podcast awards and he is, his show so is not nominated. the Poskers, <laughs> the Podskers. <laughs> no, just the Poskers. I think it, you know, I guess it could be Podskers. Podskers, pod, Poskers, Poskers. I like yeah. it. No, it was not those. <laughs> it was the ponies. Oh, snap. Oh, snap. 
But it would work if you called up Poscos, because you are you were in L.A. It's true. Yes, I was in Anaheim, and sunny California. Anyways, but it was for the awards, and his show was nominated. I walked up to him, and I said, hi, Dan, and I stuck out my hand to shake it, and he grabbed it as if he was meeting a new person, and then he looked at me, and he said, why do I know you? <laughs> and I said, because I bugged you on Twitter a lot. <laughs> and so he laughed, and he said, oh, yeah. Yeah, and he just asked us how the episode went. I let him know it went well. Taylor's a little more critical. And he said, no, it's good to have discussion. But then he went on to, to talk a little bit more. And I did, I recorded some snippets. I love how you keep reinforcing that I was the Buzz Killington here. <laughs> I mean, I was the one meeting him. I had to, I had to be a little, be the nicer one. Good it's cop, true. Bad cop. If I could have. I would have done the same thing, probably, thrown you <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> That's good to know. I'm glad our friendship is like that. Our friendship is built on honesty. Oh, my goodness. So I recorded a couple <laughs> of snippets from his talk, and I wanted to share a couple if people are interested. I don't know. Do you think people are interested? What if I said no? What if I said I'm not interested? <laughs> Just kidding. Wow. I'm interested. <laughs> okay, good. This is Dan just kind of responding to how there's so much controversy about this. I've never been in, in, involved in anything. I've been making television and a director for 20 years, and um, I've never been involved in something that had sort of, like, popped like that. Like, um, And so I didn't... I was unfamiliar with the experience of it being out of my control. Usually you just spend the whole time... That whatever you've made, you spend the whole time asking people to listen to it, and, like, maybe get some media, and you're like, please listen to it, and it's, like, amazing, and then... And then, uh, but about a week or two into it, it was it was clear that it was out of my control, uh, and um, and I wasn't prepared for the fact that, and especially now, when you put a story out there, it's not just you're not just putting the story out there and that's it. You put the story out there and people react to it and they write about it and it becomes theirs too. Um, and uh, so it just became something that was much larger than than, than what we were doing. Um, and so that was super freaky. Uh, in retrospect, um, it was, um, it just, in retrospect, after it all died down, it, I just sort of realized that it, it touched something in people, uh, and that even if even if they didn't like it, or even if they thought there was, it was problematic, or even if they loved it, like, it just, um, it engendered conversation, uh, and that was really, really exciting. That's a good reflection. Like, you can't always anticipate how people are going to react to it. Yeah. Or how many. Yeah, and he was used to TV industry where people are looking at it all the time before, mm. whereas this it was like just sent out into the world piece by piece and people are reacting to it as he's working on it. They're reacting to the finished products, you know. So I thought that was interesting. And then here is him talking about what you brought up a lot, the invasion of privacy. Okay. And the things that journalists are doing every day are much that we were doing every day that's considered real serious journalism is much more invasive than anything I did with Richard Simmons. Um, I think part of why why some people had that reaction is that, and this is what I think, I could be wrong, is that it's because we were showing people the process, like we, sh we, we played people the moment where I walked up and tried to knock on his door, but there was no doorbell. Um, and like, and we talked, and then we played me feeling nervous about it and sort of sick to my stomach and like, I don't know if I should be doing this. Um, and journalists have those feelings all the time, they just don't show it to you. You don't, you don't see them bother, you're, you're bothering people. They don't, sometimes people don't want to talk about things that are important and larger than them and you think should be talked about. And so, I think the fact that we showed people that um, was part of what made it interesting, but also allowed them to sort of see, wow, that's, that's complicated. I mean, that's true. You don't always see journalists bothering people. Mm -hmm. You're still like at invasion, because there were other, it wasn't just the process for you that was invasive. It was what all was being shared and like the possibilities yeah, and, like, things that were speculation, like his housekeeper being a witch. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's, that's not 
anything. Like, there was no concrete evidence that she was a practicing witch. And, like, still, like, that kind of damaged her reputation. Yeah. So. Yeah, So, but yeah. it was interesting going to his talk and meeting him beforehand. But then, at the awards, he did not win. And Anna Ferris's podcast was also nominated in another category. And everyone was like, is Anna Ferris here? And, of course, she wasn't. But, um, <laughs> oh, bummer. During part of the awards, you might recognize this voice. The nominees for Best Arts Podcast are. You made us win because you were presenting. <laughs> I just inserted. So it's a show with me. You pulled a Warren Beatty and made us win Best Podcast. There we go. <laughs> and the award for Best Presenting goes to Kyla. Woo! The crowd goes wild. Yeah, so I got to record um, ahead of time, voicing the nominees for the arts category. So that was cool to see my name up there. Very nice. Yeah, and hear my voice. But I was sitting in my chair, and there were people next to me, and I was like, shut up, shut up. This is the arts category. It's me. (laughs) (laughs) Wanted to hear it. So, yes, so that was my time at Podcast Movement. So shout out to all the people who I met there that are listening. It was a blast. So that's things that happened a little while ago that we're talking about now. Segment. Boom. And hopefully next year I'll get to move with you and move myself to podcast movement. That was was nice, Taylor. (laughs) (laughs) Well, should we get into this? I think we should. I agree. First segment called You're the best, you know. The worst. <laughs> this week we're asking a very uh, not important but fun question <laughs> because the reference we're talking about today happens when Lorelai and Rory are watching a movie in the black, white, and red. Is it black, white, and red, or black, white, and red? I always thought it was black, white, and red. Watched the episode today. It's black, white, and read. Boom. Black, white, and read movie theater. And we will talk about the movie they are watching in a little bit. (laughs) So we want to ask, what is our favorite scene in Gilmore Girls and our least favorite scene that takes place at the black, white, and read movie theater? Boom. Kyla, you go first. Least favorite. That would have to be Luke and Lorelai and Rory and Dean's double date because that was awkward. It started with, I think, the movie or even the food. I don't know. It ended with Bop It. Anyways, not a good date. Luke was claiming that Dean was hogging the popcorn from Rory or something. (laughs) Anyways, unnecessary, unnecessary anger. My least favorite. Guess what? Mine is the same because (laughs) that is so awkward and I Mm. hate that Rory and Dean are back together again and Luke is right when he's like, this is messed up. They should not be together. I don't want to double date with them. Yep. And I give him credit for the college try that he and Lorelai do. They try to be understanding, make it work. Rory's trying to figure this out. She's becoming an adult. You can't tell her to break up with him, but also it's so awkward. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's not a good part and not a good time. Mm-mm. Well, I'm not surprised yeah. we had the same least favorite. What's your favorite? My favorite is actually in the spring episode of A Year in the Life. <laughs> and 
part of it is a little nostalgia because when we watch it, it's like all the townies together. Mm-hmm. And of course, at the time I first watched it, which was not even a year ago, <laughs> I was so excited to see everybody in one place. And Bobette and Maury are there. And Miss Patty, I think, is there too. <laughs> Luke and Lorelai. And then they watch a second film by Kirk. Oh my God. With Pedal the Pig. And it's amazing. Yeah. Oh my word, that is hysterical. And I love when they he says, remember, no food from the outside and everyone brings out they have like <laughs> buckets and like a grill and Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good one. What do you like best about that scene? Kirk's movie or the nostalgia with all the people? Mm, first viewing was probably the nostalgia, but I think now I appreciate Kirk's second film. Yeah. I mean, how do you... I didn't think he could top a film by Kirk. And I don't know. It's debatable whether or not he topped it. But it's pretty incredible. Can I admit something to you? What? I do not remember a film by Kirk. You don't remember a film by Kirk in season two? No. When he makes his movie and he dances in the movie? No. Kyla, this is something my sisters and mom and I quote to each other literally all the live long day. Not literally all the live long day. <laughs> literally frequently. <laughs> we all, if you ever hear us say, I love you, I know, or mm, what's the other one we say? You have good taste. I intend to tell him that. <laughs> I don't remember th- that anything. Is. It's so incredible. Kirk and his girlfriend, played by Marilyn Rice Cub, are going to meet her parents, and it's like a film noir style, and then they go into the house to have dinner, and the dad says, why do you love my daughter, or something like that, like, why should I let you love my daughter? And Kirk's like, I only have this to offer. And he gets up and dances to white lines <laughs> and takes off his shirt. I have a vague memory of the dad. I cannot believe I don't and remember this. This is another thing we quote, let's eat. <laughs> we just say it in that cadence because it's phenomenal. So is it early or late in season two? Uh, it's in the same episode where Jess wrecks the car. Okay. Well, I look forward to when we get into season two, because I can't believe I do not remember what this is. So, like, when he... So, in the year in the life, I was like, oh, he had a film before. (laughs) I didn't know. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait till we get to this now, because this is just, like, one of my all-time favorite Gilmore Girls moments. I think it's one of the funniest moments in the whole show. Gorgeous day, don't you think? This pig is for reals. So, wow, lots of good discussion about that one. Yeah, what's your favorite? My favorite is not nearly as funny. It's from Love, War, and Snow, Lorelai and Max's first date. Mm. And I just really love that episode in general because of the snow. That's a and good one. Everything feels so, like, light and uh, not... Everything just feels so... I don't know like it's all coming together and Lorelai's really mm-hmm. happy and she is on her game in that date oh my goodness flirty and <laughs> I I like Lorelai and Max together when I went back and watched um rewatched the series before we started this podcast I I like them together so yeah so yeah I don't hate them as a couple it was just Lorelai wasn't, she wasn't ready. No, and I don't think long term they were a good match. I think they had stuff in common, but I think they wanted different things and. Yep. Didn't know how to communicate well. No, no, they just like weren't on it. They weren't close enough. You know, it's like one of those, how are you getting married already? You know, just not, not there yet. But yeah, I really like that date and that episode. Just very cute. I smell snow. (laughs) 
I love that line. Same. All right. Well, speaking of Gilmore Girls episodes. Speaking of that. Should we talk about... Should we talk about this episode of Gilmore Girls that you watched today? I think so. So basically, Lorelai and Rachel get to become friends. Luke is kind of weirded out by it, for whatever reason. (laughs) (laughs) Loves Lorelai. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) Rachel... Rachel finds a dragonfly in because she's taking photos of it because she's a photographer before iPhones. And uh, <laughs> Lorelai's like, beautiful in. Rachel, yeah. That's a good impression of Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, Rory is like, hey, Grandma, come out to Stars Hollow. I'll give you some sneakers and we can walk around and go to Kim's antique shop. And Emily's like, oh, all right, bloody hell. And they <laughs> find some antiques. <laughs> And uh, then Rory shows her the shed where she and Lorelai live that has precious memories to her. Emily, of course, is horrified. Lorelai, why would you take your baby away from us? Did you hate us that much that you would go and take her to a shed rather than stay with us? And a small fight ensues. That's it. Yes. That's what happened. And Rachel asks Lorelai to put in a good word. For her with Luke saying, Mm -hmm. hey, he doesn't think I'm really going to stick around, but I promise I'm really going to stick around. So Lorelai puts in a good word for her. And then Luke is all, hey, I'm going to put my arm around Rachel like I mean it. (laughs) (laughs) At the Black, White, and Reed movie theater. Mm -hmm. And when Lorelai is explaining this to Rory, they have this conversation. Luke looks happy, doesn't he? Yeah. He looks happy. They, they they seem really right together, don't they? Just right. Good, good. He deserves that. So I did the right thing by butting in the way I did. You butted in for all the right reasons. Mm-hmm. You were concerned about a friend. So if Rachel turns out to be an evil fembot and murders Luke in his sleep, I'm not responsible, am I? Only in an intergalactic court. I will say, well, when I first watched this in college, I might have heard the term fembot, but I'm not really sure I knew what Lorelai meant in the context of this at all. And I will say the second time I watched it, I knew what a fembot was, but it's a weird time to reference it, or I wasn't sure why that was the exact phrasing Like, why didn't Lorelai just say something like, well, what if it turns out Rachel really does leave? Or what if it turns out Rachel Mm. is a terrible person? Or what if it turns out she's cheating on Luke? Those kind of things. Right. Which are a lot more logical than her turning into an evil fembot. But this is Lorelai, after all. And it's never the right choice to say things the most straightforward. No. Yeah, so when I heard it, I just thought, oh, an evil robot, like, I think she was just kind of trying to be ridiculous. Maybe she was inspired by the science fiction-y movie that you could see was about to play. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I don't think I thought too much of it. It's a pretty passing reference. Yeah. And it's not a specific reference either. Right. But we're making it specific today. Oh, yeah. Fembots, baby. Yeah. So... Taylor, start us out. So, the term fembot is basically female robot, which is what I knew before this episode. Makes sense? Yes. But there's a lot more layers to the term fembot than I realized. I think Hmm. I had some inkling of it, but there's a lot more to it. If you look into the cultural history of female robots, especially in movies and TV shows, also in books, I'm primarily going to be talking about movies and TV shows because Good. that's where they show up a lot with super <laughs> cool technology. So this might be a first. Well, this is definitely a first and it might be a last. <laughs> uh, my source this time was popular science. <laughs> Interesting. 
I have to say, popular science this time was even more helpful than Turner Classic Movies. What? <gasps> Blasphemy! I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, I'm sure we will continue to turn to Turner Classic Movies more than popular science. Are we going to turn to the Turner? <laughs> turn to the TCM with your podcast fidget spinner. Oh, <laughs> it almost looks like a flying saucer. <gasps> oh, interesting. That might be relevant later. Foreshadowing. <laughs> so, according to popular science, here's a little bit more about the cultural context of fembots and what they have meant in pop culture. So, they call fembots the ultimate geek fantasy, a metal and plastic woman of your own brought alive by technology the geeks own stock in trade. <laughs> I feel like they can say it because it's popular science, you know. <laughs> Who somehow becomes hopelessly devoted to you. In both science and science fiction, the creation of female robots has tended to revolve around a housekeeper horror dichotomy. She's either a docile domestic helper or a sexually uncontrolled sex machine. So that's kind of it. Like, one or the other. Hmm. You can either be super submissive or you can be a sex maniac. Which, obviously, is accurate to women. These are our two. Yeah, These this are is our how we two function. functions. Yeah. We mm -hmm. will clean for you or we will sex for you. <laughs> <laughs> but not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and the ultimate fembot. At least in the fem <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but in the history of fembots, she's one or the other. And, according to popular science, this simultaneously embodies men's deep desire for idealized domestic companionship and their fears of being destroyed by unbridled female sexuality. Oh my god. So, I think there's we need, a lot... I think we need a geek's opinion on this. <laughs> I have some geek <laughs> tendencies. I don't know if I quite meet the... Mm, I don't think I meet quite the... Well, you're also a woman. The quota. Well, girls can girls can be geeks, and I don't mean that in a negative connotation of the word either. No, but I mean, like, to get an opinion on oh. what they just said about men's secret desire to be <laughs> whatever you just said. Yes. So if you're a man and you feel the need <laughs> and the desire... Feel free to let us know. Are these your two core fears about women? Because that seems a little reductive and unfair. But I suppose there's some truth to it, at least in the way it's represented in pop culture. Yeah. But I think it's too broad of a blanket statement to say, guess what? Guys only want the house clean or a beautiful woman. Yeah, it sounds a little Freudian to me. Yeah. Yeah. Mmm, mmm, look at you dropping your own cultural references. Mmm, mm. loves me. <laughs> so, yeah, popular science. Thank you. That's their take on fembots. I also like this sentence. Perhaps the fembot's allure resides in her ability to walk the line between total obedience and unfathomable power. You know, one thing I did notice, I don't know if this is the case in the fembots that you witnessed, but... Fembots I saw always contr were controlled by men. Mm. There's no fem woman fembot leader. So, yeah. Well, I have some examples of fembots. Let's hear them. I have some examples of fembots in TV and movies that you might be familiar with. Let's see. On TV, The Bionic Woman. Have you heard of that? might have heard of it. I uh, might have watched mm. many episodes for today. I don't know, though. Mm. I'll let you tell us more about that one, then. <laughs> you TV show now that has been all abuzz on social media. It's in its hiatus between seasons, but Westworld, which was also a movie at one point, has fembots in it. There are several fembots in Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and Rosie from the Jetsons. Their house cleaner. You're the best, Rosie. You betcha, Mr. J. Ah, oh, boy. Uh, yeah, she's a fembot. Fembot, yep. 
On Buffy the Vampire Slayer, in one episode at least, there is a Buffy bot that <laughs> is a replicant of Buffy Summers. It's quite extraordinary, really. Thank you. But I really think we should be listening to the other Buffy Giles. She's very smart, and she's going to help us save Spike. Giles? Spike didn't even bother to program my name properly. She's a fembot. Yep, there's the Borg from Star Trek Next Contact, and mm. Seven of Nine from Star Trek Voyager. I'm Captain Janeway. This is Lieutenant Tuvok. We are aware of your designations. What's your designation? Seven of Nine, tertiary adjunct of Unimatrix Zero One. But you may call me Seven of Nine. <gasps> she is a fembot. I forgot. I have not seen either of those versions of Star Trek. Oh. So if you have anything to add, fill it in. Well, she's a Borg. Are Borg really robots though? Because they're people who have been assimilated. Eh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna question that one. Put another All red right. flag. I don't think so because they are assimilated humans. Who get robot parts, so they're more like cyborgs. Ooh, She's a femborg! That's a nuance. <laughs> a femborg. Uh, no, that's a nuance, though. That's a good question. I don't know. She has robotic parts. But the base is human, so I'm going to say no. That's inaccurate. All right. Touche. Showing that up. I'm pretty sure I pulled that one from Popular Science. Uh, <laughs> what did they know? <laughs> They're not popular with me, that's for sure. Also, this is one that was not on any list of examples of fembots. It's just one I thought of. Um, It's from probably one of the greatest Disney Channel shows of all time, Phil of the Future. Do you remember? His little sister, Pim, hated Debbie, who was the super perfect cupcake-making girl in her class. And after a season or two, you find out she's actually a robot from the future. I did not. And, that's, and she's basically there to destroy Pim's happiness by being perfect. All right, Burwak. You want to throw around bribes? You're on. I'm on. I'm on what? You're on a wonderful path of enlightenment. Mm, thank you. And that path will be pushing up daisies. Oh, I sure hope so. I love daisies. Oh my gosh, I did not know, but that sounds like a good example of a fembot. She's a fembot! Exactly! Debbie from Phil of the Future! Alrighty, movies. One of the original fembots in popular consciousness, like original, the OG probably, was from the movie Metropolis. Which, actually, I know is on Netflix. It's been on my queue for a long time. It's something I need to watch for because it's a hugely influential movie in the history of film. <laughs> but it's set in this futuristic setting. And it's a mad scientist wants to destroy the machinists. Invents a beautiful, sadistic female robot that takes the place of a kidnapped political reformer named Maria. The evil Maria robot advocates war and gives a half-speech, half-striptease that whips the machinist masses into revolutionary fervor. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you for that description, popular science. I'm telling you, that's my TCM for tonight. All right. Also, other movies, Austin Powers. Yes. That is one of the more popular examples. Dot Matrix is kind of the C-3PO character in Spaceballs. Mm -hmm. There are fembots in Alien Resurrection and T3 Rise of the Machines. There's also one named Ilya in Star Trek The Motion Picture from 1979. <laughs> there is another movie called Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine from 1965 oh, with fembots in it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, now that's more. Like it, yes. Figure, coloring, poise, tenor. I wonder what they're wearing. I. Um, you mean gold bikinis? <laughs> Perfect mate for Pardo Perez. <laughs> and they are bulletproof, invincible, and chock full of feminine wiles, according to Paste Magazine. Oh my I just love reading descriptions because some of these, some of this writing is incredible and so descriptive. <laughs> And let's see, other popular examples. Eve from Wally, -E. 
she's a female robot. Yeah, but she the doesn't voice... look like a human. Isn't that but she part is of it? a feminine robot? Yeah, but how... you can't really tell. Wally. Wally. Debatable. Up for debate. Up for debate. Her, the voice in her robotic iOS ish mm-hmm. system. The Stepford Wives, hey, where, yes. spoiler alert, the husbands turn their wives into robots. <laughs> Blade Runner, Weird Science, Ex Machina, Aliens. I mean, there are a lot of options here. Yeah. Fembots are all over the place. Futurama, that one has a lot. Mm. That's a show. Yep. Fembots, I... they're everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. So... You have probably seen a fembot, even if you have not called that character a fembot. You might even know a fembot. And if you know any fembots in real life, do tell. We'd love to hear about it. <laughs> love to have them on. Yes. Oh, yeah, we should have had a fembot on as our special guest. What were we thinking? Because we don't already. Oh, snap. Don't reveal our secrets. <laughs> well, I, uh, I experienced a few fembots past couple of weeks with ooh do tell with the bionic woman <laughs> the bionic woman she was a woman who suffered a crazy skydiving accident and so she got two bionic legs one bionic arm and a bionic ear and this bionic ear can mm-hmm. pick up high frequencies And come to find out, she starts picking up these strange frequencies in one of these episodes. Turns out to be a fembot that she's picking up their communication signal. So they had about, well, they had more episodes than I thought. They had one episode, it was a part one and part two, and it was called Fembots in Las Vegas. Plot twist, Fembots are in Las Vegas. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I started watching it, and I they were doing flashbacks, and I realized, oh, these fembots appear earlier in this series. So I went back, found the episode, watched it. And then it was like, to be continued. And I was like, okay, there's a second episode. So I watched that. And it was getting to be toward the end, and I was like, I don't think they're going to finish this in this episode. Eh, to be continued. A third episode about these fembots. And finally oh, it completed, yeah. and then I went ahead to the season three Fembots, because actually these Fembot episodes, those first ones, were some of the series' most popular episodes. So that's probably why they brought them back in season three. Shout out to Fembots. So it ran for three seasons, 1976, 1978. It was a spinoff of The Six Million Dollar Man, which he is a uh, bionic man. I mean, really, so it's kind of the same thing. He has special parts put in them and he can do superhuman things and they're loving just off and on and they're made for tv movie that came out years later that ended with them getting married so congrats to them but this show man i i think it needs a new title really yes so i think that the title of this needs to be changed from the bionic woman i think it needs a little something added Maybe called the incapable bionic woman. Oh, so ouch! While she has these bionic parts, and she can fight and do all this great stuff, she is constantly treated like a damsel in distress in every episode I watch. They fear, even though she's the one with the superhuman body. Yes, parts? and the show is called the Bionic Woman. It's not the the, you know, CIA who also has a bionic woman who helps him out sometimes. It is called the bionic freaking woman. And they are always helping her up the stairs or she, like, gets in one fight. She's on bed rest the whole episode until, like, part two comes. Then she can awaken and get out. Like, she can jump three stories high 
but she is she can't needs help step, up the stairs. She can't step into a door. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. The whole time they treat her like she can't do anything. Uh, she's a great character. I like I like her spunk and she's kind of sarcastic, but not like in the superheroes you see today, like Jessica Jones, like I'm too cool for this. <laughs> she's not like that, but she just has a spunk and a good spirit. But yeah, they just treat her like she cannot do anything. So when she's fighting these fembots, these fembots never die because, or never shut down, because they're punched in the face. It's usually because they shut down, they break the motherboard that's controlling them. That has been how they defeat them every time in both the three-parter and then the two-parter later. Gotcha. I feel like that show needs to keep its mythology straight with, like, she has a super cool leg she and can jump three stories high, but a little stair is too hard oh, for her. No. Yeah, and it's constantly about her and Steve Austin, the $6 million man, and if they're going to be together or if, because she lost her memory and they're like, should we tell her that they were engaged to be married before her accident? It's like, guys, it's not, that's not what I care about right here. I want to see this bionic woman be bionic. <laughs> they had a little sound effect that they loved in the show every time she did something bionic. <laughs> such as running 50 miles per hour or kicking someone or bending someone. They loved to bend metal pipes, metal. They just love to <laughs> bend things. I'm like, great, you you bent it. Good cool. job. Thanks for wrecking my stuff. That's very bionic of you. Yeah, and so the little sound effect, every time they did something bionic, also every time they did something bionic, they did it in slow motion. <laughs> every fight, and I Everyone's mean... Everyone's favorite. Ev I mean, every single fight, Taylor, was in slow motion. But doesn't that kind of take away some of the energy of it yeah and it's when she was running upstairs supposedly running like 50 miles per hour you know super fast it was in slow motion so it looked no faster than you or i you know simba and scar didn't even move into slow motion until after they almost dropped off the cliff and started their <laughs> fight it felt very earned i'd just like to say <laughs> Yeah. You Do it to... like the Lion King, <laughs> bionic woman. Yeah, they could have learned from that. It was it was ridiculous. When those fight scenes came on, I would like kind of turn away, come back, they're still fighting the same basic area of the room and that was a little a little painful, but I got I got used to it, but that sound effect, I was like, "Oh, they're doing something interesting." <laughs> <laughs> they're doing something bionic. Uh -huh, bending that pipe. <laughs> The so part one, two, and three is called Kill Oscar. And these fembots take the places of female employees at the Office of Scientific Intelligence. So they make these female robots to look and sound like women who actually work there. Mm. Their goal is to capture the head honcho, Oscar. And so they take him. Hence, Kill Oscar. Mm -hmm. Now you're paying attention. Uh-huh. So they captured, but then they go back and they rescue him. But plot twist, they rescue his robot clone because a fembot can be a man. <gasps> <gasps> so a man bot a masculine man bot. bot a man bot <laughs> but they figure it out and the bad guy gets his weather machine makes a hurricane over an island with all of his fembots but then he makes the eye of the hurricane right where his his actual island is and so they're they're just fine so that's, that's kind of a cool plan they do a lot of debating of what is better fembot or Bionic Woman, and the guy who made the fembots. This is a nice little classic quote from a 1970s TV show. She can't think for herself. Since when is thinking for herself an asset in a woman? But he's a bad guy, right? He's a bad guy. Okay, whew. But I don't know, none of the men really disagree with him. And in the end, the the bad guy, they shut down the computer you know, after three episodes, shut down his little mainframe. Fembots go, Rawr. and he says in the end, 
Sometimes it seems the things that aren't really controllable are the best things of all. So he learned his own little lesson. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so, but these fembots, they later show up in Las Vegas because they keep one, and the guy's son is controlling them. But plot twist, the son is actually a bot, another man bot. <gasps> Whoa! So a patriarchal he, bot. Yay. <laughs> so they're just, you know, trying to do the same basic thing. And the bionic woman, she's like, I hear that, that high pitched sound again. He's like, oh, we'll get your, your ear fixed. And I'm like, dude, like a year ago, that was the fembots. And now again, you're just saying, oh, your ear must be malfunctioning. So a few minutes later, she's like, no, it's the fembots. And they get it figured out. So. Interesting. Yeah, so these fembots, I put a couple pictures, a couple gifts. I don't know if you saw those. They're definitely on our Tumblr. And it's definitely a little frightening in our, as I'm looking at them now. Yeah. They look creepy. So basically what happens is they can peel off this, their, the face, the part of the face that has like the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And once you peel that off, mm-hmm. you see... Just like these eyeballs and then this big black kind of like speaker where the sound comes out. And so lots of times, you know, you see it, they just rip off the circle. And so it looks like how they did that makeup wise Mm -hmm. is they just have that plate on the, on the front of their face. That must've been uncomfortable for the actors. Yeah, no kidding. And then you can see just like this really thick kind of skin tone coming out with it. And so it just sticks out really far from their mm. face. And so if you think about it, like you look, you watch the action scenes and you're like, wow, their face is very large. Like it, <laughs> their head, it sticks out. <laughs> but I don't know. It, it works pretty well. It's, you know, I think they did all right. So the fembots, for mine, they were, they were more powerful than the bionic woman, but they just weren't smarter than her. So, you know. They hmm. destroyed the mainframe, but you can't destroy the mainframe bionic woman. Cause she doesn't have one because she's human. No. She's got a heart. That she does. That she does. So those were the fembots and bionic woman. Bionic woman, by the way, entertaining show if you like kind of a little bit of science fiction and like some older TV shows. I think you'd like it. I know they tried to remake it a couple years ago, yeah, maybe they in the did. early 2000s, but I don't know if it did well or not. I think it had eight episodes. Yep, eight episodes in 2007. Oh, so either it was a miniseries or it really tanked. <laughs> yeah, I think it tanked. <laughs> okay, so maybe try the old classic version. Yeah, yeah. But it was fun to watch, and it was interesting seeing those fembots, because... Like, when we first did a research, it was like, Austin Powers, and it's a fembots, and their nipples are guns. And they were just all about the sex appeal, which, you know, we were talking about. They're either, like, super sexy or submissive. But my fembots, these ones were just really powerful. But they were following orders. Mm. But they were not sexual fembots. They just took female shapes. Right, right. But they took those shapes because they were the actual employees at the the secretaries at the office of scientific intelligence the osi so that's interesting because then they kind of skirted both of those archetypes in some ways like they're being the secretaries so they're keeping everything organized Mm. kind of kind of like a housekeeper not the same thing but doing a lot of the organizational work but then they're secretly hiding unbridled power (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm. All right. Let her come closer. Closer. Now, attack! What do you got? What kind of fembots? What'd you see? 
Well, I have to say, it's been a while since you and I have not watched the same thing. I think it was our Errol Flynn episode, maybe? Yes. I watched Robin Hood, and you watched Creepy Cry Wolf? Uh, Creepy... No, oh, what was it? Creepy was... Uncle Kissing with His Eyes Open. Yes. <laughs> but I don't remember the name of the movie. Neither do I. <laughs> so, Kyla, I took a slightly different route to learn more about Fimbots. All right. Because Lorelai, Rory, Luke, and Rachel, and Kirk, whose phone goes off, are at the Black, White, and Reed movie theater, I decided... Let's see what movie they were watching to see if it has any sort of bearing on the idea of fembots or give any more context to what Lorelai was talking about. Mm. And I'm going to tell you now, technically, the women in Queen of Outer Space from 1958 are not fembots because they are not robots. Uh-huh. However, they are aliens and they very much fit into the archetype of fembots. Huh. So, can I just share with you the experience of this movie? Please Because do. I made the mistake of watching it by myself. Dear listeners, whom we love, beautiful listeners, here's a piece of advice. If you choose to watch Queen of Outer Space, don't watch it by yourself, because... It is a treat that is meant to be shared with anyone else who can enjoy B-grade movies. Oh my goodness. Oh, I just, I need to walk you through the plot of this movie a little bit. So this is 1958, and it's a B-level movie. So let's just imagine mm, little to no special effects budget, and (laughs) very cheap sets, and... We'll get into some of the costumes. <laughs> but it starts out, three astronauts and a professor are going on a mission to check in on a space station that is having vaguely defined issues. <laughs> they don't really <laughs> give a good explanation. And they almost don't leave on time because Lieutenant Larry slows them down because he's kissing his girlfriend, who gets covered in dust when the spaceship takes off. And they speed up to hundreds of miles per second. And when they leave hyperspeed and get to the space station they're supposed to check in on, they see these weird rays going past the windows that Mm. make this weird noise. And then the rays blow up the space station (laughs) and terrible special effects ensue. (laughs) And then the rays hit their ship and they land on a mysterious planet covered in snow. But they decide to explore and they figure out the air is breathable somehow. And they go below the snow somehow. (laughs) And there is a jungle. (laughs) (laughs) And the professor says... This is Venus. <laughs> Even And they, the other astronauts are like, but this doesn't match the description of Venus that we ever learned about in space school. <laughs> and he's like, I know, and I wrote some of those books. But guess what? This is Venus. And he ha- never gives an explanation for how he knows this. <laughs> <laughs> so then they make camp in the jungle, and these quote-unquote babes show up and most of them are dressed like they're straight out of star trek and they have these disintegrating ray guns and they take the men captive and (laughs) there's also this one venusian woman who keeps saying bocce no bocce no because she wants them to go somewhere i guess That might be another language. I have no idea. But there is no context because they all speak English. Because apparently they've been listening through electromagnetic waves to learn all about Earth's culture. Mm. Mm. (laughs) So then they go to this very established city. And this is in the jungle underneath the snow. (laughs) Underneath the snow on Venus. And they start realizing everybody there is women. I hate them! 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 Oh, 
suppose the matter with her? I don't know. What's she picking on me for? I didn't do anything. Go. I don't think they like strangers. I don't think they like men. Yeah. Where are the men? So then they go to this court, and there are is a council, including a queen, and their faces are covered in masks. Cool. And they're all wearing, like, Oscar gowns, to contrast with the Star Trek outfits. <laughs> and they're noticing all the women, sans the women in masks, because they can't see their faces, are beautiful. And they say wonderful things like this. How'd you like to drag that to the senior prom? <laughs> and yes. weird and, way to put it. I know. And then they're trying to figure out, you know, how could this be a planet of only women? And <laughs> then they have this conversation. Professor, what do you make of all this? There's nothing but women. Perhaps this is a civilization that exists without sex. You call that civilization? Frankly, no. <laughs> so then the queen, Ilyana, which ironically is also the name of a fembot in one of those Star Trek movies mm-hmm. we talked about. She says, you guys are here to destroy us. I s- know how you people on Earth are. We've been monitoring your electronic waves for many <laughs> years. <laughs> And the astronauts try to tell the truth. This is, you know, we came here by accident. We mean no harm. (laughs) And then when the women don't listen to them, they say, Why don't you girls knock off all this Gestapo stuff and try to be a little friendly? Oh my gosh, they are not used to women being in control. (laughs) No, but also, oh boy, it just keeps going. So then... (laughs) <laughs> they get this movie oh my goodness i just can't even talk about it without laughing so then they go to their version of prison and they f- <laughs> venus is an awfully nice place to visit but i certainly wouldn't want to live here i'm much hope of breaking out surprise one of the guards get a hold of one of those ray guns Neil, why do you suppose the Queen and her counselors wear those masks? I'd assume for the same reason that Oriental potentates made their wives wear veils. Oh, you mean so the white boy can't take a peek? Something like that. Brother, they must be knockouts, judging by what there is to see. Those masked beauties may be knockouts to you. But I have a sense of foreboding about them. Feeling of something monstrous, evil. So do I. Now, I didn't say anything to the Queen. I didn't want to put her on guard. But I'm beginning to think our being here isn't an accident. I'm afraid I must agree with you. What's that? What's that? The raid that destroyed the space station and knocked us off our course may have originated right here. Oh, come off it. How could a bunch of women invent a gizmo like that? Sure, and even if they invented it, how could they aim it? You know how women drivers are. <laughs> Is that was that like seriously okay to say? These were not bad guys. In the Bionic Woman, that guy was a bad guy saying that stuff. In yours, these are not the bad guys. They're the heroes of this movie. Oh <laughs> and so then, the, Zsa Zsa Gabor, uh. the actress, uh, quote unquote actress in this movie. It's a pretty bad movie. Not much was being demanded of her. She explains to them what happened. Ten years ago, Venus was at war with a planet called Mordor. Yes, like Mordor in Lord of the Rings. Same name. (laughs) And then Queen Ilyana took over during the rebellion because the men basically just ignored her because she was only a woman. And (laughs) she won the rebellion and sent the men she... She killed a lot of men, but the ones she needed, specifically mathematicians and scientists, to a prison colony that's orbiting the planet. (laughs) So the woman didn't make the stuff the male scientist did in the prison. Well, it's unclear because Zsa Zsa Gabor is some sort of scientist. She's shown with all sorts of test tubes all the time. Okay. 
And, like, gloves and things. Yeah, this is not a good movie. So then they decide the best way to get themselves out of this pickle is that the captain should try to seduce Queen Ilyana, because clearly she only had eyes for him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and Zsa, Zsa gets jealous, because she likes the captain. <laughs> and the astronaut guys are like, man, 26 million miles from Earth and the dolls are just the same. Jealous! <laughs> oh my word! And the captain tries to go along with the plan to seduce the queen, and she tells him that they're building this, mm, they're building, they're working on this ray machine that will destroy Earth, and it's basically a cardboard box with some flashing <laughs> buttons on it. <laughs> he tries to go along with this plan to seduce her. And he basically says, you're denying man's love. You're not only queen, but a woman. And a woman needs a man's love. And then he pulls off her mask, and actually her face has been destroyed by radiation. And she says the men of the planet did that to her. And she's like, so now do you want to love me? <laughs> and he, he tries for half a second, and then he's like, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Oh my <laughs> <Sorry>. gosh. <laughs> so then Zsa, Zsa Gabor and her gal pals, who hate the queen, help the guys escape. Into the jungle, they hide in a cave that has some sort of giant spider creature in it that is just basically a puppet that they destroy. Sure. And the cave is made of gold. Just fun fact there. It doesn't really impact the plot at all. It's okay. just there. <laughs> and after they kill the spider, all the astronauts make out with their new alien girlfriends. But the guards show up, so Zsa, Zsa and her friends pretend they captured the men, and then the queen fires up her disintegrator machine, but a bunch of the women rebel, and the machine blows up with the queen inside. Mm. So Zsa, Zsa is the new queen. I think they're going to let the men come back from their prison colony. And the astronauts are supposed to go back to Earth, but they're going to be late because Lieutenant Larry is kissing his alien girlfriend. But then they make contact with Earth and their commander says, you'll have to stay another year before we can send a relief expedition. And everyone's happy because the astronauts are going to stay with their new alien girlfriends. Oh my and gosh. And Zsa, Zsa Gabor is the queen of Venus. And, or the queen of outer space, you might say. Ah. And that's when you cue up the song. She's got it. Oh, baby, she's got it. <laughs> and I'm your Venus. I'm your fire. Your, your desire. desire. Thank you, Venus Razors. For the record, that song was not in the movie because it had not been written yet. <laughs> but I wish it had been. So this movie oh was a trip, and I do regret watching it by myself, but I just am so glad I got to share this experience with you, and that sounds even ridiculous. though they are not, <laughs> I know, and even though they are not fembots, I think they do fit into that archetype of unbridled female sexuality mm. and unbridled power. You know, they have taken over, but they're also super attractive. And I think it's interesting. This is the movie that is showing at the theater when they're talking about it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, they do sound like they fit the archetype. They just weren't robots. They're aliens. Still science fiction-y, though. So, mm -hmm. fits the genre. Yes. Definitely fits with the genre, and I think it fits with the archetype, even if they are not technically robots. And they don't really have any superhuman powers. Mm -hmm. They're basically just people, humans, who live on Venus. Their superhuman power is their beauty, I would say. <laughs> That's yeah. what they have going on. Which seems to be working for them quite well. Yeah, and they do have cool disintegrator guns. That's pretty nifty. Mm-hmm. Well, and they were fighting against just regular human beings, except they were men, so, you know. Um. 
Well, and you know what it made me think of as I was watching it? Huh. It is basically the inverse opposite, whatever you want to call it, of Wonder Woman. Hmm. Because that movie starts with a group of all women living on an island, and even though they're warriors, they fight for peace and they don't really get involved in conflicts, and then when a man shows up, it kind of throws their whole world off kilter and introduces war to their society. Whereas in this movie, the war happened first, and I think it's interesting that the queen, who is evil, and yes, wanting to destroy Earth, that is evil, but it's because of this past experience in her life Mm -hmm. where she was disfigured and many of her friends were killed because of war, and... Her hating war Mm. is not necessarily a bad thing. And that's one of the things that the astronauts are just so baffled by (laughs) in the movie. Interesting. So I like to think Wonder Woman is a nice reclaiming of this movie in its own way. Yeah. Oh, Mike, you've been away from Earth too long. You kids play rough. Scotty. All right, doll. All right. We have found the intruders. Good. Bring them in. We shall do so. And they speak English. Go. 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 I believe we'd better accept the invitation. Yeah, the way those shooting irons of theirs work. I'm with you, Doc. Bacino. Bacino. You heard what the babe said. So, um... You know, as we've been talking, and as I've been thinking about it, Rachel, I know that Lorelai was making the statement. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I know that she was saying that to be funny. Rachel turns me an evil femba. That's not true, right? <laughs> but Rachel, <laughs> her, she, she looks uh, p- pretty, pretty perfect. I would say she's. Yeah. Pretty woman. And uh, her curls are gorgeous. Oh, my goodness. I have straight hair. Carrie Russell worthy. Carrie Russell. Who's that? She was in Felicity and Austin Land. And she's on The Americans right now on FX. I'm not thinking of many things she has been in. Okay. I'm sure you've seen her in something. Okay. By the way, her curls are beautiful. And, um, I don't know. I don't know. Could could she be an alien from from Venus? Could she be a fembot? Will we ever really know? <laughs> I would say her arc on the show is a little too short to make it definitive. But I think maybe the subtext of that is speaking to the fact that maybe Rachel isn't really who she says she is. Mm -hmm. And I would say in the long term, that's more or less true. Because she's like, no, I'm really going to stay this time. And then, of course, she doesn't. Right. Yeah, and and the fact that she puts on a good front with her niceness. And, like, she goes from traveling the world, photographing children in Africa, I don't know, And she comes back and is like, oh, let me fill the salt shakers. And yeah, Mm. I'm going to help in this diner. And, Mm. and it's just really like you're, you're fine with all that. And so she puts on this front of helpfulness and commitment, but it all ends. Well, and maybe, Ooh, you're making me think because that sounds almost like the housekeepery side Mm -hmm. Uh, the domestic side of a fembot. Yeah. And I do think she is very pretty, but I feel like she's also got this sense, you know, to go with the other side of the archetype besides just beauty. She has, to a modern woman, a lot of power because Mm -hmm. she can go when she wants, where she wants. She has her own career. She's defining her own life choices. And maybe for Luke it's a little uncomfortable because he doesn't 
feel like he can anticipate what she's going to do or Mm -hmm. he doesn't know how reliable she is and i think luke is a good guy i don't think he's like trying to control her like a patriarchy robot or whatever (laughs) patriarchal bot whatever we decided to call it i don't think that's it at all but i do think for him he doesn't like the unpredictability Mm -hmm. and that's true of his character in all aspects he likes things to stay the same yeah and so i think for many reasons he and rachel aren't a good match even if i think in her own way she does care about him right yeah so i think i think lorelei was getting at a little bit how rachel seems so perfect so if she's not Mm -hmm. perfect then she must just be putting on this front and is a fembot (laughs) Uh, I like that. Not like a literal fembot, but like no, if she's not actually <laughs> as perfect, then she's putting on a really good front, making it look good. Wait, are you saying she's not one of us? I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Woo, humanoid <sighs> mode coming back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> So I did a little search. This is the only time they ever use the word fembot on Gilmore Girls. But there are two instances in which they talk about robots Mm -hmm. that have interesting parallels. And I wonder, (laughs) I want you to listen to these two clips and see if you can figure out what the parallel or what the overlap between these two is. What is Paris doing here? She had to bring me the newspaper stuff tonight. She just couldn't wait. Robot. She's a robot. Actually, I'm here for the paper. I'm Rory. Oh, the press. So what do you think? Honestly, I don't know. I like your piece, and I think I like the robot and the underpants. The robot is genius. Olivia thinks (laughs) everything is genius. Only genius stuff? Okay, so you're on the paper? Oh, my God, we used to be totally obsessed with this girl who was on the paper, Paris Geller. Sure. You know Paris? Uh, I know Paris. Okay, freshman year, we both were in this moral reasoning class with Paris, and she was, like, the most intense person we'd ever met. Um, she's pretty much like that all the time. I actually went to high school with Paris. Paris Geller is a genius, and I will go to the mat on that one. But did they say she was a robot? No, but they talked about robots, and then they talked about Paris Geller. Oh. Which is two times in a row (laughs) that Paris and robot go back to back. Uh, I would definitely not call Paris a fembot, because she's (laughs) not very, um, she does not use her womanly wiles to get people's way. She mostly just uses brute force. No. With words. Yeah. Yeah. But she, there's something there. There's something going on there. Something unnatural. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think she speaks to the, I keep using this word, and I will probably never use it in another episode ever again, unbridled, unbridled power <laughs> of Paris <laughs> Geller. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. That she does have. Brute force is a good word for her. Or a good phrase. Thank you. Moron! When I say a VIP, I mean a VIP. I got them coffee. Well, if we were a Starbucks, you'd be employee of the month. But since we're not, you're just the first Smith grad I've fired this week. Lorelai, so great to see you. I am so sorry for the wait. Oh, Paris, the Don't time. stand there shaking, just go. Apologize to your parents. Tell them you'll pay them back for the two semesters you spent studying Buffy the Vampire Slayer's effect on the feminist agenda. Okay, so hello, Luke. Hi. You remember me. You're hard to forget. Flattering. Let's go. So, Taylor. So, Kyla. Is that our show? Affirmative. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, have you seen the, the Flight of the Concords? I like Flight of the Concords, but I don't know that one. The humans are dead. The humans are dead. Affirmative. <laughs> uh. You know what? I think we're going to have to add that song to So It's a Show, the mixtape. I think we should. 
Which, for the record, I don't think I've ever given a good explanation of So It's a Show, the mixtape, on the actual podcast. (laughs) But we have a playlist on Spotify, and we add at least one song for every episode that is somehow connected to our topic. It's a hoot. I like it. It brings back memories. Yeah. And maybe we'll just need to add that Flight of the Concord song, since we've referenced it. I think so. Our playlist in honor of our Fembot-tastic episode. <laughs> so that was fun, talking about Fembots. Fembots, Agreed. man. And hopefully you agree. If you, beautiful listener, agree or don't agree, <laughs> whatever. Do you have thoughts? Do you have feelings? <laughs> or are you a robot? <laughs> <laughs> Either way, whether you're human or robot or cyborg or femborg or fembot, <laughs> you can email us at so it's a show at gmail.com or tweet at us at so it's a show. Or leave us a review <gasps> on iTunes, Stitcher. Not Google iTunes. Play. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. Yeah. Google Play. Leave all the reviews. We so love them. We've read all of them. And they make us smile. Let us know what you like, dislike, so we can Boom. continue to give you good ear biscuits. Yes. <laughs> you can tweet at us individually, me, at Kyla Kahnedu, K-Y-L-A-C-A-R-N-E-I-R-O. And I am Taylor, and you can find me at Taylor Swift 13 <laughs> I'm sorry, t Blake 24 So, uh, thanks for hanging out. Here's what's coming up on our next episode. What the hell is this? The results of my shopping trip all accomplished in two hours. Impossible. I'm a savant. And everything's returnable. Yes, yes. Now sit down and relax. Let me show you what I got. Can I have my credit card back? Fine. <laughs> Looks tired. Where's Rachel? She's out running some errands. Good. Okay, last week we were talking about Meryl Streep and the whole accent thing, and Rachel said that she loved Out of Africa, but she'd never read the book, remember? Nope. Okay, so... <clears throat> I was like, "Uh, are you crazy? Isak Dennison is amazing. I love her, which is kind of crap because I never read the book either, but Rory told me it was amazing, so I felt pretty confident in my recommendation of Out of Africa. You bought her a book. No, you bought her a book. 